Hi, this is part 2 of my tutorial video, IGCSE Physics Paper 4 Specimen Paper 4 Examinations in 2020. It covers questions 6 to 11. Question 6. Figure 6.1 shows a scale drawing of a plane wave front approaching a gap in a barrier. The wave is traveling in this direction and there is a barrier here. Part A. On figure 6.1, draw the pattern of the wave fronts after the wave has passed through the gap. This is an example of diffraction of waves, so the shape will be a semicircle like this. Draw 3 or 4. Also, the wavelength of the wave fronts should be the same as the original wavelength because there will be no change in its frequency. Not too narrow or too wide compared to the initial wave. Part B. The wave approaching the barrier has a wavelength of 2.5 cm and a speed of 20 cm per second. Calculate the frequency of the wave. You need to know the formula for this. It's about wavelength and speed, so it's v equals to f lambda, which means speed equals to the productive frequency and wavelength. We're trying to find the frequency, so it's speed divided by wavelength. 20 over 2.5 and the answer is 8 Hz. Remember the unit of frequency is Hz, or you can also put it as inverse of second. Part C. State what happens, if anything, to the frequency of the wave as it passes through the gap. Well, I've set this answer for this in part A. The frequency of the wave does not change after diffraction, so it will be the same. Part D. Explain in terms of diffraction why a car radio may pick up low frequency radio signals but not pick up high frequency radio signals when the car is traveling behind the hill. Let me draw this scenario for you. The signals are coming from here, and the car is here behind the hill. The question said the car can only pick up low frequency radio signals. Why is that so? It's because low frequency signals have longer wavelengths. And when there is long wavelengths, the signals diffract more, allowing the signals to move across the hill and reach the car. Low frequency signals have longer wavelengths than high frequency signals and longer wavelength signals diffract more. Question 7. The circuit of figure 7.1 includes an immersion heater and a 6 volt battery. Part A. State the name and purpose of component X. This box with a diagonal arrow on it. This is called the rheostat or the variable resistor. Its purpose is to control and vary the voltage across heater. The voltage is coming from here, so it will decide how much voltage will flow through this to the heater. Part B. The heater is designed to work from a 3.6 volts supply. It has a power rating of 4.5 watts at this voltage. By considering the current in the heater, calculate the resistance of component X when there is the correct potential difference across the heater. Okay, it sounds confusing, they're all in words, so let's label them on the diagram and break down the question one by one. The heater works with 3.6 volts supply, so 3.6 volts here. And it has a power rating of 4.5 watts, so 4.5 watts. By considering the current, so we need to find the current of the circuit. Well, current is the same across the circuit, so we can find the current from this heater. To find the current, use the formula P equals to VI, which is power equals to voltage times current. So current equals to power divided by voltage, and that's 4.5 divided by 3.6. 1.25 ampere. Back to analyzing the question, 
Calculate the resistance of component X. Okay, take a look at this diagram. The voltage is 6 volts from the battery and the heater takes 3.6 volts. This A here is the ammeter which measures the current and it does not take in any voltage. So obviously, the remaining energy after taking out 3.6 volts from 6 volts will be at the rheostat. This is because voltage is shared in a series circuit. So 6 minus 3.6, 2.4 volts at X. So to find the resistance, use V equals to IR, change it to R equals to V over I. It's 2.4 divided by 1.25, and the answer is 1.92 ohms rounded to three significant figures. Part C. Some time after the heater is switched on, the ammeter reading is seen to have decreased. Suggest why this happens. The answer is quite simple once you know it. After some time, the energy of battery will be used up. Therefore, there will be less voltage supplied to the heater. And remember, V equals to IR. If the voltage decreases, the current will also decrease as the resistance will stay constant. Question 8. Figure 8.1 is a schematic diagram of an electronic circuit controlling a lamp. The output of the temperature sensor is high, logic 1, when it detects raised temperatures. The output of the light sensor is high, logic 1, when it detects raised light levels. The lamp is lit when the input to the relay is high, logic 1. Part A. Complete the truth table by giving the outputs of A and B. We can see that A is the NOT gate and B is the AND gate. NOT gate will give opposite of the input, so if the input is 1, it will be 0 and vice versa. AND gate will give you 0 unless both the output is 1. A is connected only to the light sensor. Let's fill in the blanks for output of A first. We just need to write the opposite of these numbers as it's a NOT gate. They are 1, 1, 0, and 0. B is connected to the temperature sensor and A, so we need to look at these two columns. It's an AND gate, so 0, 1 will give 0. 1, 1 will give 1. 0, 0 will give 0. 1, 0 will give 0. The table is complete. Part B. Suggest the conditions under which the lamp is lit. The question said the lamp is lit when the input to the relay is logic 1, meaning when the output of B is 1. So it's at the second row. Well, we can see that the output of light sensor is 0 here, which means there is no raised light levels and it is dark. For the output of temperature sensor, it is logic 1, which means it detected raised temperatures and it became hot. So it's when it's dark and hot. Part C. Suggest why B is connected to a relay rather than directly to the lamp. What is the purpose of relay in the middle? It is there because B alone cannot provide enough power for lamp to operate. Question 9. A plastic road is rubbed with a cloth and becomes positively charged. After charging, the road is held close to the suspended table tennis ball shown in figure 9.1. The table tennis ball is covered with metal paint and is uncharged. So they're gonna put this positively charged rod close to the table tennis ball with no charge, but covered in metal paint. Part A. Describe what happens to the charges in the metal paint on the ball as the positively charged rod is brought close to the ball. Well, only negative charges move. Therefore, 
we say the negative charges in the metal paint on the ball move towards the road because they are attracted to positive charges on the road. Part B. The ball is attracted towards the charged rod. Explain why this happens given that the ball is uncharged. When we say the ball is uncharged, you need to remember that there are still both positive and negative charges present. So they're asking why the ball is attracted even though there are positive charges in the ball, which may push the rod away. Well, when the negative charges move towards the positive charges on the road, they're way much closer to the rod. In this case, the attraction between opposite charges pulling each other together is greater than the repulsion between like charges of positive charges pushing away. As a result, ball getting attracted towards the charged rod. Part C. State the unit in which electric charge is measured. The unit of charge is Coulomb. Question 10. Emissions from a radioactive source pass through a hole in a LED screen and into a magnetic field as shown in figure 10.1. The experiment is carried out in a vacuum. So the radioactive emission will pass through in this direction and there is a magnetic field going into the paper. Radiation detectors are placed at A, B, and C. They give the following readings. The radioactive source is then completely removed and the readings become as shown in this table. From the data given from positions A, B, and C, deduce the type of emissions coming from the radioactive source. Explain your reasoning. So we have to find out the type of emission and it can be any from alpha particles, beta particles, or gamma rays. We have to write down the evidence as well using these tables and the diagram here. Okay, so let's say it was the alpha particles. How would they travel across this? Using left-hand rule, the field into the paper and the current towards the right, the movement will be towards the top. Therefore, alpha particles will travel upwards. For beta particles, they travel in the opposite way of alpha particles as they are negatively charged. So they will travel in this way. For gamma ray, they are not affected by the magnetic field, so they will travel in a straight line. From these, we know that at A, alpha particles will be detected, at B, gamma rays will be detected, and at C, beta particles will be detected. Let's then compare the two tables given here. The reading when the radiation detectors are placed is very low compared to the other two, and there is almost no change in A even when the radioactive source has been removed, meaning no alpha particles have reached A from the beginning, and no alpha particles have been emitted from the source. For B, we see a significant change in the readings when the radioactive source has been removed. So gamma ray has been detected. Also for C, we see a big difference when the radioactive source has been removed. Then again, beta particles have been detected, meaning that the radioactive source emitted both gamma rays and the beta particles. If you write this in words, it's like these. Question 11. In Geiger and Marsden's alpha particle scattering experiment, alpha particles were directed at a very thin gold foil. Figure 11.1 shows five of the nuclei of the atoms in one layer in the gold foil. Also shown are the paths of three alpha particles directed at the foil. Part A. On figure 11.1, complete the paths of the three alpha particles. The top one is pretty close to this nuclei of the atom, so it will end up like this, deflected down the layer. 
The middle one will go straight through as there is no nuclei nearby. The bottom one is going straight to the center of the nuclei so it will be completely deflected back in this direction. Part B. State the result of the experiment that shows that an atom consists of a very tiny charged core containing almost all the mass of the atom. How do we know from this diagram that the mass is concentrated at the center of the atom? Well, you can use the example of the bottom one where it is completely deflected because of the nucleus of the atom. Next, state the sign of the charge on this core. What are the components in the nucleus of an atom? There are protons and neutrons, so the overall charge will be positive. Next, state what occupies the space between these charged cores. There's pretty much nothing except few electrons, so you can write nothing, or vacuum, or just space, or electrons. Part C. The nuclei notation for an alpha particle is 42 alpha. State the number of protons and neutrons in an alpha particle. We write the proton number at the bottom, so it's 2. The number on top stands for the nucleon number, which is the sum of protons and neutrons. So to find the number of neutrons, minus the proton number from the nucleon number, which is 4 minus 2, and the answer is 2. That is all for this paper. Thank you for watching. If this video was helpful, please like this video and subscribe to my channel if you want to watch more videos like this. Also, tell me in the comment section which paper I should do next. Stay safe and God bless you guys. Bye!